Um, but there's lots of solitary bees which will go for um, go for sort of mason holes in your south-facing walls because they always like to sun the bees. And I do. I I, I get my buddley out every February and I chop it back, but I just cut the little twigs which are hollow um, in the six-inch um, lengths, and I tie them up and I just put them. Um, in the in the sunny part of the, the trees, for instance, around the garden, and you get the mason bees will also nest in, in wood holes as well. So all these different solitary bees are nesting individually, uh, all nesting in different places. Some in the ground, some in roof spaces or um, attic spaces, and some in your masonry. There's even a tiny little black bee called a, a carpenter bee, which only nests in cut off bramble stems. So they've all got their own little niche, um, but they do like to, to be in the sun. So we do buy a, a, bug, a bug hotel, a bee hotel, make sure you put it in the sunshine because you probably won't get nesting in the shade. You might get some bee hotel in the shade, but that's all the, all the um, this is a, a bit of a, a wide selection in this one. Um, mostly, just about all from the Elm Valley, where I live. And the Elm Valley, as we know, is a, Especially protected area, and not just for the birds and the trees and everything, and the plants, but also for bugs. It's got a few scarce bugs, a few, a few moths, and a few butterflies. I don't, I don't collect moths and butterflies. These have all been found dead. And, um, and then I'll just pass that one. These are just some um, water beetles on the top, and then some cucumbers, and then water bugs. Now the water bugs, there's only 66 species, but they'll be quite familiar names. You've all heard of pond scavers, yeah. yeah. You've all heard of, uh, you've probably heard of a water scorpion, yeah. water stick insect, back swimmers, yeah. greater water bowmen, lesser water bowmen. There's 33 species of these, so they make up half the bugs. Yeah. Water measurer, and the, um, this is a saucer bug as well. So lots of familiar sort of common names to a lot of these, um, these things. So obviously you'll recognize your small tortoise shells and some of your whites. Yeah. Most of the white butterfly, people, Cambridge Ray Day area, yeah? yeah. people see a white butterfly flying in the garden, see all oh, cabbage white. Yeah. 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 Well, cabbage white could be a large white or a small white, but I guarantee nine times out of 10, it would be a green vein white. And green vein whites, when you turn them on the upside down, Veins have got the so that's a better one. They've got lovely dark green veins, which the other two haven't. So there's a green vein right like that's upper wings. But if you, when, so when they close the wings, you can see that it settles on your bud beer. So that's what they like from above. And people mistake them for a larger, small white. They've got lovely green veins. And the other two have just got tails. So they're quite distinctive. So nine times out of ten, it would be a green vein white. Yeah. Particularly like, uh, they come out very early and they're still flying now. So they come out when you get the orange, just before the orange tips come out. And they're laying eggs sometimes on the same cuckoo flowers. Because the orange tips love to lay eggs on cuckoo flowers. And the green vein white butterflies will also lay eggs on cuckoo flower. We think, well hang on. Why aren't they competing? And the reason is they're laying the eggs in different places on the plant. The orange tip butterfly lays an orange egg on the flower head, and the caterpillar hatches and it just feeds off the flower buds. The green veined white lays a white egg and it, le it lays it on the base of the leaves. So they're not competing because they're feeding on different parts of the plant. Isn't that amazing? And you can find them in the spring if you turn over to find little orange eggs of orange tips. So all these things are all the little different niches. It's quite amazing. Okay. And to be truthful, I've been studying bugs 35 years or more, and you've got to be half a botanist, really. It really helps, because if you know your plants and know your trees, you can often search for bugs which only feed off one particular plant or in different places. And uh, that's a bit of a clue, uh, very much a clue. So if I'm, if I'm, I often, I mostly use a, uh, when I'm collecting bugs, I use a, 
a sweep net. This is a very small one, mine's about three times as big as that, because I put it over my head. Mm -hmm. And I can get my me, me jar lid off, and I can get my hands in, and my body stops things from escaping. Get a few bugs up in there. <laughs> so, uh, in fact, my, my, my colleague Mike, Mike, Mike the Fly, and um, just lives in, in town here, just opposite, um, he was going down Abbey Premier Lane a few years ago. And of course, with doing flies, the trouble is when you're, you're just sweeping through the grass and tapping things from your hedgerow in there. And then uh, the trouble with flies is and bees, they always go up. Beetles, which is my particular interest in beetles, beetles always stay down. So that's the last things to fly out of beetles. So I've normally got a few seconds time. But flies go quickly, so you've got to put the net over your head, otherwise you're going to escape. So you jar up all your bees and wasps first, obviously, and then you go for your flies. But actually, uh, Mike was down his lane a few years ago, and uh, he had a bit of a tap on the shoulder. Uh, excuse me, sir, would you like me to accompany you to the station? And there was a police officer, someone was from the police on him. It looked a bit dodgy, Mike, with his head in the net, you know. So if you see anybody with their head in the net, Actually, an entomologist, so probably Mike, or we sat, or Nick. <laughs> We're very fortunate in uh, the Raider area, and um, so I'm, I'm Phil the Bugman, and my even my um, email account is uh, Phil the Bugman at hotmail.co.uk. And um, so people send me mystery photographs of bugs. Phil, what's this? And I try to identify them. But I'm also the the county. Um, invertebrates recorder for Radnorshire. So um, I just lived three miles up the Elm Valley on, on the Radnor side. I used to live in Elm Village for a few years, but that's on the Brecknock side, so I had to move because Radnorshire is my county. So I keep all the records of all insects in Radnorshire, and I'm up to uh, a couple of hundred thousand records at the moment. Now, I will record dragonflies, butterflies, and moths as well and bees and things but we've actually got separate county recorders for them groups and um, that much they're very well known so we've got bob dennison who lives at crossgate who's a dragonfly recorder so i send all my dragonfly records each year to him and we've got janice who just lives a mile from me she's our janice is our bee and um bee and wasp recorder and she, she does a few hover flies as well because they are a bit similar Many of you probably know Janice, she's done a few talks and things. And then, um, and then there's Mick, Mick Collins, um, my star, he's, he's, he's a beetle man. Mick the beetle, he's a beetle, beetle through and through. And his, he's got a collection of beetles from around the world, because even when he was younger as a kid, him and his brother collected beetles. And he's got this vast beetle collection. Massive thing as big as your hand from around the world. And if you visit them, his lounge, on the wall, he's got this one meter large glass case, this big, of the biggest examples of beetles from around the world. So if you go for a cup of tea, you have to be subjected to this biggest beetles in his land. So, <laughs> so his wife, Alison, just puts up with it, obviously. Um, <laughs> and then we've got Mike, Mike, Mike the Fly. Mike is a professional um, dipterist. A dipterist is a, is a fly expert, and he's actually did the whole of his, um, his um, uh, university degree in entomology, which was actually a professionally trained entomologist. So he retired to Raider 20 years ago, found my name in the back of a, a journal that we both subscribe to, and um, we've been friends ever since. And Mike, he doesn't drive, he always comes out with me and does um, all the flies. And he does quite a lot of other things as well that I don't do. So we make quite a good team. Um, and then we've got a separate butterfly recorder and a separate moth recorder as, as well. Um, Pete and Ginny Clark, who live down at Glazebury. But that's exceptional because most of us tend to live around the Raider area. And you'll find this in any county. We tend to live sort of in slightly the better areas for collecting things. And if you go down to Brecon, um, half the county recorders, so the bird recorders, plant recorders, insects, whatever, Half of them live around Clangorse Lake for good reason, because it's a bit of a hot spot. Okay. And Raider, because of the Elm Valley and Gilback, there's just some fantastic reserves around this area, and it really is uh, 
one of the best sort of areas, um, certainly in, in Radnisha, to collect it. Not that we ignore all the other parts, but we've got some brilliant, brilliant sites in Radnisha. Um, so that's, uh, that's what I do. Um, so I'm a professional ethnologist, so I'm a self-employed ecologist, so I do plant surveys, bat surveys, very crested new surveys, bird surveys, whatever. But half my paid work, believe it or not, people pay me to do insect surveys. So half my work is insect surveys. So I cover not just Mid Wales and the borders, um, but I cover the whole of South Wales as well. And occasionally venture up to North Wales. Um, because there's not many entomologists in Wales who can do what I do. Um, so I've been doing this year, I've had I've been surveying 50 road verges for the Trunk Road Agency from Welsh Pool down to Brecon, plants and insects. And I've been doing um, quite a bit with Powers County Council as well. And I'm also doing um, quite a few things for the Wildlife Trust, um, who've got various projects going on. And I also work quite a lot for Natural Resources Wales, who've got some very good uh, nature reserves that they directly manage. I did a massive survey in Havron Forest in Montgomeryshire last year, a pollinate survey, 25 day survey. So that was a massive, massive, um, massive um, survey that was. So yes, yeah, so I get to do all sorts of things and uh, I, I love being out. So um, if I'm in the office and it's raining for two days, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, but I mean insects, you know, it's, I, I started, you know, I remember starting with a, plastic ice cream thing with a bit of cork in the bottom stuck in and got me first fly in there 35 40 years ago and it's just grown and why it's grown is because I, I'm a trained engineer originally but not much future in engineering so I actually I was always interested in wildlife when I was a kid I used to go bird watching me teens you know things like that I'm still a bird ringer I still do a lot of bird ringing and stuff as well and um, but when I came to Wales, it was only when I came to Wales I really had the opportunity to, to take it up uh, more seriously. And because I, I came here to work as a ranger in the Elm Valley 30 years ago, it was a summer job, and I stayed there 13 years. <laughs> so and I worked for the Wildlife Trust and all sorts of things over the years, but I'm now self-employed, so uh, but I'm just working for the Wildlife Trust part-time at the moment to, on a project we're doing. Um, so I've been allowed with my conservation work, working on nature reserves, I've been allowed then to do surveys and a lot of the surveys were um, on, on insects. So that's my interest and, and um, profession is like and skills have, have grown as, I, as I've worked on these nature reserves sites over the years. So I've been very lucky really. And I'm a great believer in just learning in the field. You've got to get out there and just, you know, that's how I learned. I'm self-taught and, you know, um, there you go. It was my hobby and it's now half my paid work, which is incredible, really. So there we go. Um, so anyway, I'm going to pass a few bugs around. So um, I did sort some out here. Now, local bugs, uh, bear in mind we've got 30,000 species of bugs in the UK. And obviously not all in one place, hasten to add. Um, but locally we have some very important areas around, say within three or five miles of, of Rayleigh here, and we've got some beautiful, lovely old woodlands, haven't we? Some of the trees, you know, like behind Ellen, Ellen Village, um, you know, sort of Don Dowlon Estate around there, we've got some 400 year old oak trees, you know, fantastic things. And they've been there so long that individual trees are so important because they've got the longevity of wood. So there's a lot and lot of beetles, particularly a few flies and a few other things, hoverflies, but mostly beetles, which feed in dead wood. So people think you put a few a few dead logs on the ground, great. Well, that's yeah, it's fine for a few years. Tend to be a bit damp get a lot of wood lice in there, might get a few ants, and they rot very quickly. But if you look around at some of these big oak trees, on the tree itself, the branches naturally die back. 
very safe because we're reducing some of the wind blow, really. We're getting rid of a lot of small branches. So the branch falls off on the ground, it's, it's good for a few years, but it rots too quickly. But if a branch is still attached and it dies back, you've got what's called standing dead wood. And that's going to last, you know, four or five times as long than things on the ground. So, and you've got all these oak trees, so these beetles, the wood boring beetles, and the feeding, particularly under the bark of these trees, particularly when they're dying back, okay? And some of them are really specialist. And my favorite group of wood boring beetles are the 70 species of longhorn beetles. They're all quite big and they're all quite colorful. So I'll pass that round, I'll pass them round. So you recognize longhorn beetles because they've got long antennae. And they're normally very slim, slim and elongate and some lovely colors. You'll see even some of them dark longhorn beetles have got sort of dark yellow stripes and spots that are trying to mimic a wasp for protection because it's only bees and wasps that can sting of any insect. Okay? So a lot of the things, hoverflies, famous for mimicking the, the wasps and bee colors because things like birds are probably the main predators of daytime flying insects. Okay, and the sea in colour. So a baby blue tit comes along after it flies, picks up a wasp and gets stung, it'll never touch a yellow and black stripy thing ever again. So there's a lot of other things which try to mimic them colours. You know, even some dragonflies do it. Beetles do it commonly, the hoverflies do it, but you'll see some of the longhorn beetles do it as well. Okay, now if you're going round, just to give you um, I'll just pick, some of these are quite common, some of them, and they'll all feed in some part of dead wood. Now some of them go for hardwood, some softwood, some will go for small branches, some will go for big branches. Some of them aren't interested in branches unless they've fallen and they've been there five years. Okay. So if you look at that lovely scarlet one on the end, that is very red. Okay. And that was hatched out John Dr. Buckins, you know Dr. Buckin, just off the mountain road there. John Jake Buckin, who's a locally famous uh, detective author. His third volume, I think, just come out now. Um, he actually had some brought some oak logs in his house, dried them out, and blow me, he had quite a lot of these beetles hatched out in the middle of the winter because they were next to the fire drying out. It should have been hatching out in May and June. So he didn't want to do with them. <laughs> so he, he kept one for me, and that's one. So unfortunately, the heat just made them um, hatch out. Um, so it's an interesting one. It's called the oak longhorn beetle. And it only occurs in seven sites in the whole of the UK. And we have four of them here. So we've got the Elm Valley. They occur around the woodlands around Rain and Gilbert. He occurred Bailey Ion, just Shaky Bridge, east of Clandrimdod. And then he occurred Shropshire, one site in Shropshire, Mockers Park in Hereford, and then a couple of places in southern England. And that is it. Okay? The only feed of really old oak. And they're very specialist. So it's a really good example to show you how specialist these things are. So the oak longhorn beetle, it looks a bit like a cardinal beetle, which are bright scarlet, similar size, but they're a different family, okay? So the oak longhorn beetles, what they do is, they're not interested in any old fallen oak branch, oh no, it's not as easy as that. They're only interested in branches of oak which have fallen the previous year. Okay, so we're in the second year. So the fallen, being blown by the wind, so the fallen on the ground. And I've got a theory. The reason for that is, trees, at one time we thought mushrooms and fungi move into dead wood when it dies. It's not the case. 
a perfectly young, healthy oak tree, and most trees have a fungi living in it right from a little sapling, okay, or a, or a small tree. And they just live there for sometimes centuries, perfectly in the tree, and as the tree grows, the fungal hyphae, the little roots of the fungi just grow with it. And it could grow with it for hundreds of years. But then when the tree finally succumbs, it's under stress, it's starting to get old, it's on the way out, the fungi then start to fruit, okay? And obviously, when these branches fall, they then become dead wood, and the fungi then within just weeks or a couple of months will start fruiting, okay? So these fungi will give off um, a lot of smell, and these people smell the fungi, and that's how they find the branches, and that's how they find each other, because a lot of these wood-borne beetles, how do they find each other to mate? Uh, some of them go to flowers, like you know brambles and hawthorn in the spring, and it's the white flowers they like. Daisies are great as well, oxeye daisies, that kind of thing, umbelphas, great. That's the only time they're able to then meet and mate, going for nectar and flowers. But these oak longhorn beetles don't do that. So as soon as the branches has fallen two years later, presumably two years, then the fungi then are starting to fruit. And of course, these things are smelling a fresh fungi just on two year old oak branches. So the meeting and mating on these branches, then the females then are laying eggs. And then the egg hatches from the little crevices of the bark. It then drills, the little grub drills in just under the surface of the bark and it just feeds in the a first layer of wood. And then they don't hatch for five years. They're in there, it's grubs five years before they emerge, which is very unusual. Most insects emerge every year but these beetles, it's like eating cardboard all your life. It takes them a lot of time to get that nutrition to grow big enough to emerge. And then when they're big enough, then the grubs will burrow towards the surface, just, just leave a little lid, a thin lid of bark, and then they change it to Christmas fall, normally over winter, and in the spring, late spring, May, they'll then change it to an adult beetle knock the lid of the bark and they emerge and fly to another falling branch. So you can see why these oak longhorns have become rare, because what have we done for centuries? Before we invented modern central heating? Collective firewood. We still do today. And um, what we're going for? Fallen branches. So if you look around, there's not many big fallen branches, even in the big oak woods. Okay? But at one time they used to be more common. So they're getting scarce because there's not enough fallen oak for that particular species. They're hanging on just in these very... So it's so rare, it's called a red data book species. So it is very, very rare, okay, in the UK. And we're very fortunate to have it here, locally, between the Elm Valley and Tanvindorf. Absolutely incredible. So watch out because the first one I saw flew into the door at the Vista Center and flapped it, and it was flapping on top of the window sill in about 1993. <laughs> and I let it go, so I knew what it was. <laughs> but John kept that one for me, so it was already dead. So that's just one little example of you know how rare these things are. I don't think you realize how important the radar area is, particularly for woodland insect. We have lots and lots of rare species. We've got we've still got big old trees. And if you go through Wales, some of the, the big deer parks, like sort of Bruggenog in Montgomeryshire, uh, sort of, um, what's the one, Van Dyerville, uh, Deneva Park, another fantastic 500 year old oak trees. These beetles need that longevity of wood to be able to survive, okay? So really important to have. So what you tend to find is, the longer the habitat has been there, the more rarer insects you're going to get. The most insect managing habitat for insects 
tends to be based on scarce and rare species. If you've got a rare one, you might need to manage just for them species. Okay. Because a lot of them are in common and widespread, but some of them are. A lot of them are restricted to certain habitats. But that oak longhorn beetle, beautiful scarlet thing, it really is incredibly unusual and, and very rare. So it needs a specific um, condition to survive. So, and now just what I've done here is, I'll pass it around this way. Right, then moving on, we've got, um, again, these are all, all local. Some of the specimens are from further afield down in South Wales, but they all occur around the Rayner area. So, this one, these are all stings. So these are all bees and wasps. It's only bees and wasps that can sting. These here, mimics are all harmless. Hoverflies, believe it or not, that massive thing there, you might have seen them flying around forest trees and wood yards. That is the giant wood wasp. It looks ferocious, massive big tails sting, and uh -uh, harmless. It is a very primitive, it's still a wasp, but it's a very primitive wasp called a sawfly. Same as like gooseberry sawfly and red cone sawflies with a pest on, on fruit. This is harmless and it feeds in dead wood. And they even buzz like a wasp, got lovely stripes like a wasp. It's got a long, when it comes around, have a look closely, that's one of the biggest ones, female. The male is slightly smaller. It's got a long black tail, which looks like a sting. It's a, it's a squeeze drum. You squeeze it in soft with timber. Not interested in standing wood, but as soon as it's held, they're flying about these dead conifer logs. <coughs> and foresters know these really well. So it squeezes its black tail just under the bark, withdraws it, and then it's got a little short little yellow tail, which is just an egg device. And it just injects an egg into the hole, and it just feeds the grub feeds the dead wood. So there we are, so that's the, the stingers. Be careful because um, I'm hand, fine to the handle these, but uh, obviously when insects, it's just the air which dries them, they'll preserve forever. But obviously rigor mortar sets in and you'll get a few antennae flying off and legs and things if you do uh, drop them or something. So there we are. So that's the, uh, that's the non-stingers. But you can see how, what I've done was, I'll, if you line them up together, I've tried to match up the sort of the mimics um, with the um, with the stingers, yeah. So a lot of these things, as lots of beetles do it, hoverflies do it. They're not just producing the colours haphazardly. They're trying some of them match individual species of wasp and bee, and some of them, the hoverflies probably do it the best. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. So I have laid them out. Yeah. There's also a couple of things here in terms of colours. This is um, this is a bit of an odd one, this one, because it looks like a wasp. It's not a wasp. Believe it or not, that is a bee. Okay. And it's called a nomad bee. Okay, because it's one of the solitary birds. Okay. And these lay eggs in other solitary bees' nests. Now, it's a bit of an odd one because the difference, you think of wasps evolved yeah. first. Okay? So wasps came first, and bees are descended from wasps. So you think of a bee, like a bumblebee, just a big, fat, hairy wasp, because that's what they are. But wasps are mostly predators that take in caterpillars live food in the nest. Bees are all vegetarian. So somewhere along the evolution, the wasp went, they're all taking meat and stuff. There's a bit of a, oh look, there's lots of flowers here. I'm sure we can get some from there. And they get enough protein from the, from the drinking the sweet sugar nectar and then feeding the growth of pollen. So they split off. But the taxonomic difference, you need a bit of microscope between wasps and bees, Wasps have got, haven't got much hair, but they've still got a few hairs on the body, and their hairs are single hairs. Bee hairs are always divided, which is logically, it's logical because bees collect pollen. 
And if you watch a bumblebee and a honeybee, yes, they stick, they've got big, big patches of so pollen stuck on the back legs. But before they stick on the back legs, they're collected from the body hairs. Around the head, around the body, there's a transfer of the legs to the back leg when they're flying around. Okay? So that's why the hairs are divided, because it's, it's more potentially areas to stick the pollen. So wasps don't. They haven't got used to their hairs. But this one is almost evolution. This is the one which is sort of between the two. Because when you look closely under the microscope, it's, it's few hairs it's got are divided, but it's not a wasp. It's a bee, and it's gone the other way. It's lost most of its hair to mimic a bee, but it actually goes down inside the nests of other solitary bees. It's a cuckoo bee, and it lays an egg on the little pollen stash that the bees collected that bees its group of. And the egg of this thing hatches first, and it nicks the pollen, and the bee grub dies. This thing is exactly the same thing. This is a wasp, this is a cuckoo wasp, or a ruby-tailed wasp. And if you get your hand lenses, that is one of the most beautiful insects you can see. These, if you go to your house walls in the summer, I guarantee you've got at least one kind of mason bee nesting in some of your house um, little holes on the south facing side. And if you haven't, get a hammer and some nails and knock a few holes in the wall and it'll soon happen next year. That's what I'm doing. After they're finished, these things then come out. A typical wasp, they're very robotic in movements, and they're predating, they're finding the cells of these mason bees, drilling in, laying an egg on the pollen, seal the entrance up again, and blow me, their egg hatches first and the pollen. So there we are, so that's a couple of cuckoo, a cuckoo bee and a cuckoo wasp. But look at the hand lens with that one. It's metallic pink and metallic bright green. It's an incredible thing. So, you know, it's sort of like saying that's a wasp, but it's, it's not really something about it which makes it interesting. I just had to spend weeks with you guys. So over here, I'm just sort of trying to mix it up. Eh? So a couple of sheets here are printed off bug life. Rare beetle. Okay. This is a ground beetle. Now you might have heard of a violent ground beetle, which are the big black ones. Kids see them scurrying across the floor or somewhere. It's the same family. The ground beetles. And they tend to come out at night because they're predators. And they run things down. Well, big legs, they run things down and feed off other things running along the ground. Big jaws are crushing. Okay? This is another ground beetle, but it's lovely metallic. It's metallic, sort of greeny bronze. Okay? And the first one I found was running across the road in Elm Village. My friend Mick had one on the. Um, the road above Raven School, running on the road, okay? And then, blow me, last year, I lived just behind the and my hotel, my daughter, I was having a bike ride with my daughter, just coming back, and she saw one running in front of the hotel, on the road. What? Uh, and then we had another record last year as well. So there's five, there's about five records. Now, it's like Steve Jones, who's now in Pembrokeshire, was at Tanuffle, yeah. and he will have on the sandpit, kid's sandpit in the garden in Tanuffle. So I've got five records in Radnorshire, this beetle lovely, around Raider. Nowhere else, okay? And if you say it to me, necklace ground beetle, that doesn't mean anything to me. Because with producing new books, every time a new book comes out, the publishers say to the author, well, we want to engage more people. We want you to come up with common names. So every time a new book comes out, it's got new common names in. It means nothing to me. Because the books I use just use Latin names. But if you say Carolus Onlus, I know exactly what you're talking about. So I've had to learn the common names myself now. So we'll give it the name of Necklace Ground Beetle because it's got lots of little bumps down its wing cases. If you have a look at the hand lens, and there's two little options. Now what I don't agree with here is it's got a little map in the UK. It tends to be mostly southern central England here. So it doesn't give many records for Wales, okay? But it says here 
it's actually associated with agricultural plowed land. Uh, we haven't really got any agriculturally plowed lands. We've got to grass crop down here, so I think that's a little bit off. But all the records I had have been on road sites, so which is open and flat. And of course, roads tend to be a little bit dry on the verges, so it's obviously sticking to the roads. And occasionally, that one was squashed, it was found dead. That's why I take it. So, yeah. But there you are, just for example, um, it, it's very rare. And uh, so it's called nationally scarce. Okay. So it's been taken less than 100 sites in the whole of the UK. And I've got five here, just around within three miles of radar. Fantastic. There must be other places, but, but you know, if you're walking along the side of the road, do keep your eye open for things. I'm always, my head's always down when I'm walking along. Looking at, you find squashed things on the road, and occasionally you'll find something really scarce. It's amazing. So yeah, so they're associated with drier conditions. Presumably that's why we found them on the road. Weird. Another example. Okay. Uh, right, and I think we'll stop there because I'm sure time's getting on.